Hello. Now, my name is Daryl Roll, and I'm one of the co-directors of the Um Umal Jamal Archaeological Project. Now, I'm coming to you today from Bert's former office, and as I join um, today with students and Um Umal Jamal Project team members who've been mentored by Bert and Sally, I'd like to think that Bert would be proud of the various papers that are part of this session. Now, my paper today is really a report of work that is in progress instead of completed research. And while I'm a bit disappointed that I haven't been able to get as far along with it as I'd have liked, um, I'm encouraged by Bill Carraher's recent championing of slow archaeology. Now, slow this particular work has been and probably will be for some time to come. And with a site like Um Umal Jamal, slow but meticulous is probably best, even if we'd all prefer fast, but just as meticulous. Now, other papers in this session have introduced different aspects of Um Umal Jamal. And I understand that this site probably isn't new to most of you, um, but I always like to provide a general overview just in case. So, Um Al Jamal is the best preserved ancient town in the southern Haran, that volcanic basalt plain of southern Syria and northern Jordan. And it's the town's exceptional preservation, especially for the period from around 400 to 800 CE, um, that offers a unique window on the daily lives and behaviors of small town communities in a time of extraordinary regional transformation. The visible ruins that give the site its dramatic and distinctive character are primarily from this period, representing a combination of domestic and religious structures that are nestled within and around the remains of earlier Nabataean and Roman civil and military architecture, including at least two Roman forts. And all constructed in a vernacular style that's characteristic of the Haran, um, including around 150 houses and a total of 16 churches um, that belong to this period. Um, and there's also evidence that a couple of the houses and maybe a church um, uh, might have been converted into mosques during the Umayyad or Abbasid Caliphates before the site becomes largely abandoned around the beginning of the 9th century. Now, depending upon your perspective, Um Al Jamal can be seen as quite small or rather large. And I think that we too often describe it as a small town, which may technically be accurate, but also masks just how large the site really is. Measured from the modern road that circles the ancient walled town, Um Al Jamal has an area of 46.3 hectares, or 86 and a half football fields, American football fields. Um, now, this is nowhere near the size of a modern city like Chicago, um, uh, where the conference is taking place uh, live, nor even as large as just the Chicago Loop. Um, uh, it is, however, just about the same size as the museum campus um, near the uh, Chicago Hilton. Um, uh, in Chicago, from Soldier Field South parking lot up beyond and incorporating the entirety of the Field Museum and the Shedd Aquarium. Uh, and I hope that those of you who've had a chance to uh, visit the conference in person um, did uh, go visit some of these uh, great locations. Um, so as a well-preserved ancient site that can be visited and explored on the ground today, I think Um Al Jamal is rather extensive and not really small at all. That being said, um, though, in terms of late antiquity, we really should understand the site as a rather ordinary-sized, smallish town. Um, just to give some other examples, the small Roman city of Pompeii, um, being 66 hectares, is about one and a half Um Al Jamals in size, while the old city of Jerusalem, about 105 hectares, is about two and a quarter Um Al Jamals in overall area. And while it's not huge, the substantial size of Um Al Jamal is a big part of the reason why it's so special. 
many other sites across this region have uh, ruined buildings or scatterings of ancient structures, but few, if any, offer the combination of so many ruins that are so well preserved and so heavily concentrated in so large of a space and that mostly belong to a specific period. Um, and further, where other sites might come close to matching Um al Jamal, or where they exceed it in terms of one or two of these features, these are usually parts of major urban centers, while Um al Jamal represents what's probably an ordinary town and the kind of place where most people in the ancient world would have lived. Um, so the purposes of the paper today is to explore some of the story behind how we've come to understand the site's overall plan. And when it comes to detailed documentation, individual building plans, and an overall site map, that story begins with Howard Crosby Butler and the Princeton expedition to Syria who visited and recorded the site on two occasions, in 1905 and 1909. Now, they weren't the first Western travelers to visit or write about the site, because there were earlier visits that are known um, by Western travelers, such as William John Banks, Cyril Graham, and G. Schumacher, um, the latter of whom produced the earliest known plans of individual structures at Um al Jamal in 1894. The Princeton team, though, were the first to attempt an overall site map, as far as we know. And this overall site map is the result of only two weeks of survey work during their 1905 visit. Butler led on the creation of plans for individual structures, including 20 houses, 15 churches, and the buildings that he called the Praetorium and the barracks. Um, but while Butler often gets the credit, including in my original paper abstract and subtitle on these slides, um, the Princeton Expedition's full map of Um al Jamal was really the product of Butler's surveyor, Frederick Norris. Now, in publication, Butler acknowledged that the full site plan was incomplete, um, saying, and I quote, In map number one, the buildings that were measured are shaded gray, and the groups of private houses are numbered by Roman numerals. The groups of which only the outlines were measured are left white, and it will be seen that there still remain large areas within the walls that have been left blank in the map. These are strewn with ruins, most of which are too completely destroyed for the making of satisfactory ground plans. Yet I have no doubt that later explorers could add much to the detail of the map by tracing the walls of ruined houses among the masses of debris. End quote. Now more than 60 years later, Bert DeVries would answer that call. And we're going to get to Bert's specific contributions in a few minutes. But I want to take a quick moment to say how much I miss him. We first met about 15 years ago, and I didn't know him as well or as long as our other speakers, some of our other speakers in this session. Um, but I now sit in his old office every day. I teach his old courses and have the privilege of working with the wonderful team that he built at Um al Jamal. And it was my privilege to get to know him in the past few years. And I'm really honored to be his successor at Calvin. I know that I'll never measure up to Bert, but I'm grateful to be able to stand on his shoulders. And I hope that I can make some meaningful contributions to continuing his legacy. And working together, I feel confident that we can do that. But before we get to Bert's own contributions to the mapping of Um al Jamal, it's worth noting that both he and John Wilkinson had separately evaluated the Princeton Expedition's work, including an analysis of both final publication and the original field records. Now, Bert's evaluation focused on Um al Jamal specifically, while Wilkinson's sought to evaluate Butler's wider output, 
including both of his Princeton expeditions, as well as the earlier 1899 American expedition to Syria. Now, Wilkinson, writing in um, uh, an article in uh, the journal Levant back in 1984, um, is harsher on Butler than Burt is. Um, but both identify several problematic aspects of the work. Butler hadn't read Carraher's um, uh, slow archaeology um, work and didn't seem all that interested in working slowly um, and carefully. Um, instead, he measured quickly and incompletely, making only basic and small plan sketches that were not to scale, using feet and inches in the field, and only converting to meters upon final publication. Perhaps the most frustrating is Butler's constant use of 90-degree angles, which gives a very false impression of the regularity of the structures, which isn't always reflective of reality on the ground, as is the case with the Southwest Church shown here. Still, ever gracious. Burke concludes that the Princeton Expedition results are, quote, good enough for general study, and... Um, because of the massive deterioration of sites between the beginning and the end of the 20th century, we are indebted to the expedition for the sheer volume of sites and buildings recorded. So now let's turn to Bert's own work at Umm al-Jamal, which started in 1972. Now one significant complication was the intervening Druze settlement within the site, along with the many renovations and reconstructions that they had completed over a period of about 30 years, between the time Butler was there and the time Burke came. Now, while some of these could be reasonably identified, um, it can also be difficult to distinguish between some of these 20th century renovations and errors in Butler's plans. There was also a French army encampment um, in the site, during the 1920s and the later um, occupation by the Masaid tribe. Um, and these also represent activities that could have transformed elements of the site between the time of the Princeton expedition and the beginning of Burt's work. The general site map as we know it, um, though, is virtually unchanged since the 1970s representing the product of primary survey work completed in 1972 to 1974 um, by Burt, and the entire southeast quadrant of the site, from the large Roman reservoir south and from the central open area east, was surveyed by hand and wall by wall using a long tape, theodolite, and a single assistant. Completing the rest of the map, though, was made significantly faster after collection of aerial photos and a derived topographic map in 1973. And this mapping then focused in on tracing visible wall lines from the aerial photos with more limited on-the-ground measurements. And altogether, this added 107 additional housing complexes um, beyond what uh, Butler had had drawn, and it helped to identify an earlier Roman fort at the site, um, what we call the early Castellum. Now, in addition to the uh, mapping and survey on the ground, um, excavations were part of the process, and excavations began in 1974 in the form of soundings designed to avoid known architecture but to establish a baseline ceramic chronology. And then um, new excavations began to explore particular structures starting with the 1977 season. And this work, um, a significant portion of which was supervised by the late Tom Parker, um, continued to provide data that required minor revisions to the overall site plan. And ever since, um, new aerial photos, including a 1992 low-altitude balloon shoot, and many seasons of vertical or oblique photos taken by the Kennedy and Bewley Aerial Photographic Archive of Archaeology in the Middle East team, have helped to lead um, uh, to generally confirm Burt's general plan, 
while also helping to refine particular aspects of that plan. Now, there also has been some GIS work, um, uh, but this has been somewhat limited and um, uh, is, is currently in need of uh, collation and refinement. Um, GIS work developed in stages um, ever since the early 2000s. Um, local and regional data and base maps were acquired. Um, there's a wide selection of shape vials that were created of key structures, features, excavation areas, reservoirs. Um, but there's many different versions, not always in sync, um, in various coordinate reference systems, um, drawn over different base maps uh, or aerial images that aren't geo-referenced the same. Um, and coordinates are often poor once we zoom into the scale of individual structures. So while most of the existing GIS work looks great at the scale of the full site, we try to move into individual neighborhoods or particularly at the individual structure level. Um, the shape files can often be off by several meters in any one direction. So this brings us to the present where we are seeking to build on all the mapping work that has been done over the past 100 plus years to continue developing a comprehensive and as accurate as possible spatial record of Umm al-Jamal. Now recent work over the past two years has begun to, much more slowly than desired, bring together, compare, and assess the quality of the thousands of digital mapping records we have for Umm al-Jamal. A 2017 drone survey by Mars Robotics has provided the best quality, comprehensive, vertical photographic base map of the whole site to date. Um, and this seems to have been geo-referenced fairly accurately. Um, but when we zoom into the scale of individual buildings, our existing GIS data is off. As I said, often by a few meters in any given direction. Um, so while this scale, uh, looking at the whole site, um, the quality of the GIS work so far um, is probably just fine for um, visual mapping purposes at the whole site level, um, we're no longer just interested in visualizing the site as a whole. And we're working to fine tune our spatial data for the greatest possible accuracy um, and detailed spatial analyses in the future. So in addition to redrawing all of our structures and excavation areas with this new photographic base map, we've begun plotting each individual excavation trench. Um, and this makes it quite clear just how little excavation has been done, as seen here with the later Castellum, or barracks, building. And we're also using this high-quality aerial imagery to draw each individual length of wall, whether it's part of a recognized structure or is merely a remnant of some former structure. And at the scale of the main walled Byzantine period town, the latest version of the maps you've been seeing so far is starting to look a bit like this. But really careful attention to the aerial imagery adjusted using a range of different visualization techniques and um, incorporating photos taken at different times, years, and seasons in both vertical and oblique formats are allowing us to see new features that aren't included even in BERT's latest plan, um, including a collection of at least 30 new features that so far I've tentatively identified over the last year as worthy of on the ground investigation or ground truthing. In some cases, the aerial images provide only sub subtle clues that I admit I may be over interpreting. Um, while at least a few though are absolutely certain structures that have somehow escaped previous documentation. And aerial examination is going to continue to work. We're going to expand this. We're going to continue refining our understanding of the site, identifying specific areas to document in greater detail on the ground. 
So while we have some plans for excavation in our next field season this coming May, a significant part of the field work will be ground truthing and architectural documentation of the features we're now possibly identifying in the site's northern sector. Now, I'd like to think that Bert would be proud of this work and that he'd love seeing new structures being surveyed and mapped during the 50th anniversary of his first season at Umel Jamal. We look forward to doing that work and to continuing the great legacy of Bert and Sally at the site. Shukran Kintir, thank you very much.